Hey guys, today we're going to talk about the Reformation, starting with Martin Luther. No, not Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther, the German guy who had the shaved head, or at least part of the shaved head. Funny story, Martin Luther King, in some ways, is actually named after Martin Luther. His father, Martin Luther King Sr., when traveling in Europe and learning about Martin Luther, actually has his name changed to Martin Luther. And so, Martin Luther King, being named after his father, who changed his name, has a lot of connection that way to Martin Luther, just the symbolic connection of being somewhat named after him. Okay, there are multiple sections to the Protestant Reformation. Again, let's go ahead and start with Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a monk in Germany, and he becomes a monk because on the road one day, when he was actually studying to be a lawyer, he almost gets struck by lightning, and he promises God that if he'll save his life, he'll devote his life to the church. And so he becomes a monk, and at this time we have a number of things going on in Europe. We have corruption in the church, and the main corruption being the sale of indulgences. That's what Martin Luther is really going to attack. Now an indulgence is a fancy sheet of paper that you buy that shortens your time in purgatory. Purgatory in the Catholic Church is kind of a place between heaven and hell where you can work off your sins to become pure enough to enter heaven. And so an indulgence is a way to shorten that time for either you or a family member, you know, whoever you specify when you buy the indulgence. Martin Luther is going to attack indulgences because there's no scriptural basis for them. And he sees it as a corrupt way for the church to basically raise money to get more money. Think of indulgence kind of like in Monopoly, you get a get out of jail free card. Indulgence is kind of a get out of purgatory free card, except it's not for you, you have to pay for it. Another thing going on this time with the Renaissance is humanism. Remember, these two events are happening around the same broad time period. And remember, we talked about humanism with the Renaissance video as the value of the individual. And so in religious circles, they're going to take this in a number of ways. The first is that religious humanists wants to go to the source. They want to make sure that everything they do is found in scripture. Also, we have the importance of the individual, that every person, every soul is important in God's community. And this is going to be even more so with Martin Luther's justification by faith that everyone can become saved. Another big thing that's going on this time period is the printing press. Remember we talked about movable type with China, that it's kind of like a big stamp? Well, it's going to make its way to Europe and become the printing press. And the printing press is going to be really useful for Luther because he's going to be able to spread his message. Whereas before, people weren't able to spread their message about things going wrong in the Catholic Church because you would have to write things over and over, and that makes a very limited amount of copies. Whereas the printing press, you can make a lot of copies really quickly and get them spread out really quickly. And Luther also writes in German, which is the local vernacular language. And this is going to be very dangerous to the Catholic Church because it means ordinary people can read what he's writing. Whereas the Catholic Church is in Latin. All of the services are in Latin because that's the level and the language of intellects. Okay, so we talked about how Martin Luther is against indulgences. He, on a trip to Rome as he's a monk, is going to see the sale of indulgences, and again, he finds no scriptural basis for them. So he writes up a list of complaints about indulgences, the 95 Theses, and he nails them to the church door on Halloween, on October 31st. And he nails them to the church door because that's kind of like the Twitter page or the Facebook page of the time. It's like the community bulletin board. People would go to the church and read announcements for the town. And these complaints, these theses, are going to be taken, and someone's going to copy them down in the printing press and spread them out so a lot of people are going to be able to read them. And that's how Luther's movement is going to spread so quickly and so broadly. Luther will write a number of other things attacking the Catholic Church, and he's able to, again, use his pen, use his words, by writing in the local language, by using the printing press to spread his movement. If you went against the Catholic Church, you were considered a heretic, even if the Catholic Church was wrong. And so Martin Luther is tried as a heretic in Worms, which is a city in modern-day Germany. And not Worms, I know it 
looks like worms, but it's pronounced bombs, and he is found guilty of heresy. But before he is executed, he is kidnapped or saved by his local prince, because at the time, the Holy Roman Empire is a bunch of small German kingdoms kind of placed together in an alliance under the emperor. And Martin Luther is kidnapped and he's put in confinement by this prince basically for his own safety. And while in this safety, Martin Luther is going to translate the Bible to German again so ordinary people can read it. And this is dangerous for the Catholic Church because now ordinary people can question what the Catholic Church is doing. Luther's movement will spread particularly to the lower classes, and we talked about before um, things like Islam and early Christianity and Buddhism really resonating with the lower classes, that salvation for all coming in. And so it's going to spread, but also spreads to the elite, the local princes. And they are going to go before the emperor and demand religious freedom, and they're actually going to win. This is known as the Peace of Oxford. But this doesn't mean that everyone gets religious freedom. It means that the princes get religious freedom. So here's how it worked. If I am your prince, and I decide we're going to be Lutheran, if you're anything but Lutheran, you will be hunted down and killed. But if you're in another prince's kingdom and they're Catholic, and you're anything but Catholic, you'll be hunted down and killed. So this is going to be problematic and lead to a number of religious wars. So again, we don't have religious freedom yet, but it's it's a start. We're getting there. So this is the first Protestant movement, and Protestantism comes from the word protest. They are protesting the Catholic Church. The next Protestant leader is going to be John Calvin, and he and Luther are going to disagree on a number of things. Luther's main belief is justification by faith alone, which basically means that you accept God's grace either yes or no, and that's how you get salvation. Whereas in the Catholic Church, salvation comes from the sacrament. So Catholic Church believes that you have to work for, you have to have good works to earn salvation. Martin Luther believes that salvation is open to anyone, you just have to accept it. John Calvin believes that some people are predestined to have salvation. He believes in predestination. And so either you are born going to heaven or going to hell, and there's nothing you can do about it. Martin Luther disagrees with that. Martin Luther believes in something called free will. But for John Calvin, he believes that if you are one of the elect, if you are predestined to go to heaven, that you will naturally do good things, that you'll naturally follow God's teaching. So if you're doing that, then you know you're one of the elect. Another area that they disagree is in the sacraments. They both believe in two sacraments. Remember, the Catholic Church had seven. Well, Martin Luther believes that only two are found in Scripture, and John Calvin seconds that. But the way that the sacraments are done and how they're interpreted differs, and I won't go into that. The next reformer is Henry VIII, and Henry VIII of England has a very different reformation than the other two. His reformation isn't initially about religion. It's about love, kind of. It's about having a son. Henry VIII can't have a son. His wife, Catherine of Aragon, is no longer able to have children. They have one daughter, and he's in desperate need of a son. Because at this time, if you didn't have a son, then the heir would go to the next male in your family. And Henry wanted a sound line because wars had been fought in England over unsound lines, over who would be king. And so he desperately wants a son. And so he goes to the Pope and asks for an annulment, which is the only way you could end a marriage in the Catholic Church. Pope says no. And so Henry breaks from the church and gives himself a divorce. He becomes the head of the church, which we'll talk about in a little bit later. And so he divorces Catherine, and this starts with the wives. So Catherine of Aragon first gets divorced, and she lives out her life in England. You know, pretty comfortable living. Next is Anne Boleyn. And Anne Boleyn is going to be a big pusher in Henry breaking away from the Catholic Church. She's also going to have a daughter named Elizabeth. The first daughter was Mary, which will become Bloody Mary, and no, not the one in the mirror, but the one who killed a lot of Protestants. So Catherine had Mary, Anne has Elizabeth, and no, not the modern Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth I. But she doesn't have a son either. And she does a couple of things, which you know we don't know if they're true or not, like she's accused of being a witch, and she's accused of having incest with her brother, 
Yeah. And so that is treason against the king. That is an act of treason against the king. And if you are a traitor, you are beheaded. And so she is beheaded. So we've got divorce beheaded. Next wife is Jane Seymour. She has a son, but she dies in childbirth. And this son, Edward, is going to be king for a little bit after Henry, but he is always going to be a sickly child, and he's going to die, you know, pretty young. So we've got divorce, but he had died. Then we have Anne of Cleves, and I told you I'd tell you a story about Anne of Cleves. When um, Henry is trying to find a new wife, he marries Anne of Cleves for that alliance. She comes from a Protestant kingdom and so it's for a Protestant alliance and Henry doesn't meet her until their wedding day and he sends an artist to paint a picture of her well he's a little more flattering in the picture than Anne is in real life and so when Henry finally meets her on their wedding day he says that she looks like a horse so the marriage doesn't last very long he divorces her and she lives out a country life in England and actually they become pretty decent friends later, but nothing romantic. Next wife is another Catherine, who is very young. She's like a teenager, and Henry's, you know, in his 40s. And she has an affair, and so is beheaded. Last wife, a third Catherine, is going to outlive Henry, and she's only one. So we have divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. They are the wives of Henry VIII. Okay, so I talked about before how Henry becomes the head of the church. So he basically establishes a theocracy in England. He is the head of the church. There are church officials like the Archbishop of Canterbury, but they're under Henry. They're under the king or the queen. Today, technically, England is still a theocracy. <laughs> and so Henry makes the decisions of what's going to happen in the church. And we're going to see changes of belief in the Church of England. Kind of later on but to start out with it's very much like the catholic church they still have saints there are nuns in the church of england but it's going to evolve and you've probably heard of the church of england just don't know it in america it's called the episcopal church or the anglican church and they changed their name after the revolutionary war because it was no longer popular to be the church of england <laughs> imagine that and so it's going to be very similar at first to the Catholic Church, but again, that's going to change later on. Um, they do, you know, follow the rest of the Protestants with only two sacraments. So after all of this Protestant stuff is going on, the Catholic Church kind of re-examines itself at the Council of Trent. And at the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church basically states what they believe. They still believe in purgatory. They still believe in the seven sacraments. They still believe in indulgences. And at this time, they have a new group of monks known as the Society of Jesus or Jesuits whose sole mission is to go and convert Protestants back to Catholicism. But they're also kind of used as Catholic assassins, like they're going to try and assassinate Queen Elizabeth. So that that's the Jesuits or the Society of Jesus. So to wrap things up, there are a number of effects of the Protestant Reformation. I promise you we're almost done. First is the breakup of the Catholic Church. And we had the Great Schism before, which broke up the East and the West Church. But now the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, is going to be broken up into several pieces. We have several different Protestant faiths, as well as the Catholic Church, and this is going to lead to a number of religious wars. And all of our wars in Europe, up until the Thirty Years' War and the Peace of Westphalia, are going to be pretty religious-based, and then we're going to change into more political-based wars. Another effect we see is the rise of nation states. Because we're not all connected to the church anymore and because our rulers, especially like Henry VIII, is going to have a lot more power, we see the rise of strong nation states. Another effect is we have no more monasteries and we don't have church lands in Protestant countries. All of those lands that belong to the Catholic Church are seized by the crown and all of the money that was used from those lands, all the taxes that was gathered, um, and even in the monasteries, the place where the monks live, all of those really nice, you know, golden crosses, all the things that had monetary worth are sacked and sold, and the money goes to the crown. And so that's going to hurt the Catholic Church economically. And they're also going to be hurt politically because, again, we've lost that unity. They don't have their stronghold in Europe anymore. 
we are going to see a change of culture in Europe and this will become more evident when we talk about scientific revolution and enlightenment. You know, this is kind of the first successful questioning of the church. This breaks down and you know, this with the Renaissance are going to break down old feudal society and we'll see that happening more and more in European history. That's all I have for you on the Protestant Reformation. I'll see you next time.